and we're going to talk a little bit about integrated deer and pest management. We covered deer very heavily last year. We talked quite a bit about it, um, deer. So this will just be kind of a brief overview of, yeah, that's great. Thank you. This will be a brief overview of, of deer control. And um, the long and the short of it is there's not a lot of new information on deer management. Um, more and more studies are being done. You all probably don't need the studies just to see the impact of deer. Um, and I, th I think the key to deer management and deer damage management is to understand deer. And you'll, you're going to hear this word over and over again. I talk about intimacy. Um, people hate it when they're t thinking about pests that we have to become a bit more intimate. But it isn't the intimate that you're thinking of right off. It's just we need to become a bit more knowledgeable about what these pests are. We don't have the, the well, we'll talk about this later on. In your packet are two good fact sheets on deer management. One is, uh, or, or uh, fact sheets, one is the resistance of ornamentals to deer damage. And it's a listing. And a lot of you would argue with it, um, as I do, um, because deer across the board are a lot like people. And what I mean by that is some of the times you get into a city or an area and everybody's eating Italian food. And then everybody in another area is eating German food or whatever. So what this list may say, and the biggie that I disagree with is they list a particular species of daylily the deer don't eat, and I don't <laughs> see deer differentiating between daylilies, especially this one, Stella deora, which is very widely planted. So, um, and this is interactive. Please ask questions as I go along. Uh, but the key with deer management is really this, this quadrangle of arrows at the top, and it's population management, maybe using repellent and scare tactics. And this is on that fact sheet, so I don't feel like you have to write all this down. And then exclusion with vegetate or with uh, fences or other obstacles. And fences are tricky because they give you a standard height of eight foot. And we have some high jumpers out there that have cleared eight foot. So I hope there isn't a genetic drift going on where we have <laughs> deer. And vegetation management. A lot of times deer do that for us. My favorite story was I was out at Cromwell Valley Park and I was helping out with a forestry survey, and we didn't see anything on the ground except for a really tiny shrub. And we scratched our heads because it was so small, and we were looking at it with our magnifying glasses. And finally, we ripped a leaf, and we smelled it, and it was a, 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 a shrub that usually is four to eight foot tall called spice bush. And if you're familiar with it, it's on that list of deer don't eat it, or <laughs> rarely eat it. Well, they mowed all this stuff down to the ground. So, it's great to have these lists, but a lot of times you're going to have to go with personal experience. And as you've probably seen, deer pressure is driven frequently with, um, by the weather and population and what you have out there. Um, Carolyn will be talking a little bit about diversity in the landscape, so I won't steal her thunder. But that's, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about deer shelters and deer protection. Um, later on in my next talk when we talk about what you do to what you do with uh, freshly planted woody plants after they've been planted. So that'll be in the afternoon. Stick around. Okay, the good old days. Um, it's interesting because we loved chemistry and in a sense we still love chemistry. Um, and there were these old fashioned products, lead arsenate, chloridane, DDT. I still bump into people that are very reminiscent and their eyes close and they lean back when they hear those <laughs> names and they really embrace them. And in a sense, they did a good job. They killed our pests. Um, anybody familiar with bed bugs? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, my condolences. <laughs> you, don't even, you don't even have to have them to become familiar. You're starting to hear more and more about it. Even if you're car wasn't hit by deer, you know people whose car has been hit. Bed bugs are becoming the, the same thing. It's, they're becoming very common. And one of the factors they think is phasing out of DDT. But there could be other issues coming around. But we loved our chemistry. Um, does anybody familiar, or is anyone familiar with lead arsenate when it first came out? Uh, it, it was actually when gypsy moths first um, broke out back in, um, 
gosh, when was that? I guess in the 30s, and they started using um, lead arsenate. Now, if you think about it, this is primitive. You're throwing two toxic heavy metals out there, and it was used very heavily, especially in the uh, fruit industry. And a lot of people worry if they buy property that they know has been on an old orchard um, because this stuff doesn't disappear. It tends to bind to the, the soils. So you see a lot of it. Um, but fortunately, I guess for all of us, these chemicals have disappeared and there's new chemistry. We're going to approach IPM. Well, 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 we'll get into how we're going to approach it, but we're going to talk a little bit about chemistry. Unfortunately, I can't hit all the topics I want to hit and hopefully this will be a teaser that you'll come back next year and we'll do something on weed control and IPM, uh, leafy green weed control. Um, so we're going to focus a lot today on insects and disease primarily. Um, okay, intimate, intimate pest management. That's what I'm calling IPM. It, it, what's integrated pest management mean, you master gardeners? What's keep the good and best, practices. best practices, keep the good. That's good. Anything else? Ah, oh, great. Integrate from a variety. My star pupil right there, Barbara Walker. So does anybody recognize the bug on the right? Kissing bug. We really don't have this species here, but I like the name kissing bug. Um, and, but it, it really does, it, we need to become more familiar with our pests. Those old-fashioned shotgun chemicals that I had up on the early slide, for the most part in our country are gone, unless you have them in a collection. And there are collectors. They come into my office every so often and say, hey, you know anybody who has DDT? And I say, oh, no. <laughs> so they collect, but it's a big thing. Um, so, does anybody recognize this interesting looking insect that isn't a master gardener? No. Throws out half the audience. <laughs> ladybug larvae, okay, good. That's uh, what a ladybug larvae looks like. And I can remember the first day I, I got my job, not it was first day, it was probably the first month, and somebody came in with a, a couple of these and they said, what is this? And fortunately, I was new, but I understood what this was. I said, oh, this is neat. This is a ladybug larvae. This is great to have in your landscape. This is one of the good guys. We talked a little bit, and then he said, how do I kill it? <laughs> so, but it happens. But the basis for IPM is, and I'm going to show a short video. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, this is a, an entomologist at College Park who's doing this brief video. His name is Mike Raup. And it's, the video is on IPM, but in the vegetable garden. But the principles that he spells out are very good or very appropriate for what we're talking about today. <laughs> Stink bugs, ah! squash bugs, ah! cucumber beetles. Ah! Hey, if you're growing vegetables, sooner or later, you're going to have problems with pests in your garden. Hi, I'm the bug guy here for the University of Maryland Extension, and today I'm going to talk about an approach for managing the pests on our plants, which we call integrated pest management. The integrated part comes from the fact that we're going to combine many different tactics and approaches to manage these pests. Hey, we're going to use cultural controls, mechanical controls. We're going to use Mother Nature's hit squad. We call that biological control. And when we have to use pesticides, we're going to try to use the ones that are most environmentally responsible. And in this way, we can produce really healthy, safe vegetables to eat. Step number one in putting together an IPM program is to build your knowledge base. Learn about your plants. Learn about the proper culture, rates of fertilization. How are you going to make your vegetables most productive? In the case of these beans, this beautiful trellis allow these guys to grow up and just produce bountiful uh, fruit. 
The other thing to learn, of course, is the pests that are going to attack these vegetables. In the case of beans, one of the major nemesis are the Mexican bean beetles. So learn about the history of these, learn their damage characteristics, how they're going to affect the plant, and that actually learn what the various life stages of these insects look like. Here's the adult Mexican bean beetle. Once you build your knowledge base, then you're ready for step two in your IPM program. Monitoring is the second step in building an IPM program. Monitoring means the regular inspection of your vegetables and what we're looking for are symptoms and signs of insect activity. Symptoms are things like the defoliation that Mexican bean beetles are causing. Signs are the insect itself. So right here we can see the eggs of the Mexican bean beetle. Sometimes using a hand lens can really help us see very small insects and their eggs or even mites that are on leaves. If you monitor often and thoroughly, you can really stay on top of these pests. The third step in building an IPM program is decision making. You've gone out, you've monitored your plants, you detected your pests. Now you have to decide if and when it's time to treat. In the case of this tomato, hey, there are a few aphids on the leaf, but guess what? There are some ladybird beetles eating this thing. I'm not doing anything at all. But in the case of this squash vine, I think I see some squash vine borer in here. A single larvae could kill that vine, so I'm going to have to do something right now. Decision making, that's the third cornerstone in building an IPM program. The fourth step in building your IPM program is intervention. In this case, we're going to use a floating row cover as a preventive tactic to exclude pests. Another preventive technique we can use is the use of kale and clay. This is applied to the leaves of plants. It makes the plants unfavorable. The bugs simply don't go there to feed. A third intervention tactic is the use of biological control. This is simply using Mother Nature's hit squad, the predators, parasites, and pathogens that naturally occur and can reduce pest populations. When we've exhausted all other tactics, we may choose to use a pesticide to help reduce these populations. What we like to use are compounds that are on EPA's reduce risk list, those that are safe to use in organic gardening. Always read your insecticide label and always be careful when you apply pesticides. The fifth and final component of an IPM program is record keeping. Record keeping is used to simply keep track of what you saw in your garden and when you saw it. This will help you be prepared next year to figure out when you need to intervene. Also keep track of how well your interventions work. In this way you'll know if a biological control or a certain pesticide that you used actually did the job. Record keeping is the fifth and final component of a sound IPM program. So that's it, gang. Remember your five steps of your IPM program. Build your knowledge base, monitor your plants, make decisions. When you see those bad boys, smack them down, intervene, and finally, keep records of what you found. In this way, you're going to be able to produce a beautiful, bountiful, healthy crop of vegetables that are really delicious. Okay, so as I said before, and kind of what Mike was talking about is you really do need to become a little more knowledgeable or intimate of, with your pests and also the control options. Um, they're always changing. I know I work with uh, a gentleman named Brian Butler who tends to work with the commercial orchards and farmers, and we're both asking ourselves constantly, boy, is that product still labeled for use on this crop? it's changing quite rapidly, um, probably for good reason. And you've noticed, as we mentioned earlier, not just those old standout DDT, DDT chlordane, lead arsenate, but a lot of the 
chemicals that were around in the 40s and 50s are starting to come off the shelves and more targeted pesticides are coming out. Not all of them. Some of them I think we're, we're starting to abuse quite a bit. Um, things like imidacloprid and, and, and things like that. And what happens when we use chemicals a lot? Especially one chemical. Resistance, resistance yeah. We, and, and resistance is where a population of insects starts to develop a genetic change so that it can handle that particular pesticide. The pesticide no longer affects it as dramatically as it did at, at one point. And please stop me if you have questions or something doesn't make sense. Ah, my pointer stopped. Ah, anyway, we can do it the old-fashioned way. Okay, this is an obvious one. Um, beware the snake oil mists, and I call it crap. And that's just products that are out there that are being sold or peddled or advice, that, the recommendations that are being made that just don't make any sense and don't really have any science behind it. Our fearless leader, John Tronfeld, who runs the State Master Gardener Program, always gnashes his teeth when he sees Jerry Baker on public TV when they have their fundraising event. Here it is. This is a great programming institution, public television and they put Jerry Baker on, who's kind of hawking a lot of his books that really have terrible information. <laughs> Not all of it. And actually, whenever I have a chance and I'm at a, a, a consignment shop or whatever and I see a Jerry Baker book, I, 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 bu I buy it because it, it's great to look through it. And yet, yesterday I took a peek. And one of the things he recommended here was shampooing your lawn. <laughs> you actually took out detergent, and he still recommends it periodically. I see it show up on some of his websites. It's always good to spy on the other side and see what they're recommending. Um, and a lot of things have made it kind of into current culture and trends, the idea of wearing golf shoes when you're outside or shoes with spikes to actually aerate your lawn. What, how much pressure does a foot have <laughs> compared to, say, some of these large tires? A foot, your body weight has a tremendous amount of pressure. And there's been many, many studies showing that using golf shoes doesn't loosen the soil any more than, than walking on the soil. So the, uh, you're, it's going to be full of this stuff. He even has something about secretaries, how they should act. And, uh, this is a bit dated. It was 1973, so that isn't fair. I know things have changed since then. Um, the other thing are there's still some myths that are still out there, and this is one of my favorites. This really doesn't deal with IPM, but it talks about when you plant a tree or a shrub that you should prune the top of the, the tree back. Has anybody heard about the, the keeping the shoot to root ratio? It, that when you plant a newly planted plant, you pull it out of the pot, that you cut the top back. Really, you shouldn't do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, further on. But that, that myth is still very common. Doesn't mean you're going to kill the plant, but it does set it back. You aren't doing it any favor. OK, so it's not just about bugs. I already mentioned this earlier. We're going to talk about, um, we talked about deer. Um, another one that I should mention that many people aren't aware of um, this came in two weeks ago. It was my favorite. This guy said all his little uh, willow oak seedlings that he had in a crep planting, these are plantings typically done near streams and areas that need some trees in them, um, were falling over. And he thought the trees were rotting out. And I'll pass this around. Please give it back. This is such a great sample. And it's weird because people will bring in samples of dead bugs or whatever, weeds. And I'll always ask them if I can keep it. And they look at me funny. But these are great to have as props. But um, if you look at it, you'll see the damage that voles, the, the classic damage that voles make on um, plants. And it's really apparent on this one. This is actually quite exaggerated. That's why I held on to it. So I'll pass that around if you guys are interested. Go ahead. Don't chew on it and destroy my evidence. Um, we'll talk a little bit about plant species and also about diseases. Uh, but we'll start with bugs or insects. Um, IPM, as we already heard, is a combination of strategies. Stanton Gill, who writes an IPM newsletter. And if you're interested, you can Google Stanton's name and sign up for that newsletter. It's really meant for the industry, but it comes out weekly. It's online. And it updates you on when pests are going to be hitting your area. So you can almost stay ahead of the curve 
by looking at that pest report. He gives recommendations. A lot of it is for the industry. Some of the chemicals he recommends aren't available to you. But it's good, solid information on the pests, at least, in their life cycle. And it does give some good IPM strategies for how to control these pests. You don't get bombed with spam mail from this, and you only get the newsletter during the growing season. It pretty much finishes up in October. So, um, okay. Just some basic stuff. We kind of talked about this already. Learn to tolerate damage. This is a very un-American thought. It gets back to that person who brought in the insect, and I constantly get it, where somebody brings in a leaf and it has some aphids, and it's very early in the spring. And aphids tend to come out in numbers in the spring, and it's not a bad strategy if you're trying to make a living off a plant, because they get out a little bit ahead of the predators. So they're able to make a living. The predators, are, predators meaning the insects, are critters that eat them. So. Invariably, people will bring in roses or honeysuckle or something else that is infested with aphids, and they hate to hear that, hey, learn to tolerate some damage. Wait a little bit, because some of the better insects, or what we consider better or beneficial, will be showing up to curb that population. Very hard for Americans to do. Um, wait for the good guys. Kind of goes hand in hand with that first statement. Um, we generally don't enjoy applying chemicals. Some of the times we need to. Integrated pest management doesn't mean organic. But there are some very good chemical control strategies. And frequently, I tell people, hey, just take your garden hose out and spray that plant down as hard as you can. If you have the Alberta spruce and it starts getting brown frequently, it's spruce spider mites. And a garden hose will work just as well as a miticide. Um, and it's very effective. But part of that means you need to kind of stay on the ball and be out there looking at those plants. And we tend not to. And I see this time and time again, especially with vegetable gardening. We fall in love with the idea of growing your own vegetables. And then reality hits in July when the heat goes up and maybe the water turns down and a couple pests start showing up. And then people are less frequent visitors to their gardens. So if you really want to adopt this, you need to make sure you're always monitoring. I think it's fun. It's, I think it's silly. You grow a garden, and then you don't visit it. You look at it from the window. That's silly. But we do that. So get out and monitor things, simple things like a stream of water. If you're out there monitoring, usually you can catch a population early. And it's just a matter of squishing some eggs. I love the faces I get some of the time. I just squish the eggs, and they'll die. And it's like, oh. I'm not touching those, <laughs> or picking them off in a plastic bag if you have to do that. Um, what's our love with fire? Yes, I'm sorry. Do you, do you have a specific book that might be in the library here or something? That I, I, I actually have some recommendations at the very end. Okay. And I wouldn't say a book because these recommendations are constantly changing and the pests as we've all seen recently, are constantly changing. We're getting, there's an accelerated growth in new pests from the 70s, well actually from the 50s on up to our day, that it's almost a geometric progression of these, um, these, these new pests coming in. So I wouldn't say depend on a book, but we have an, a website that is, actually the last slide gives great information on how to get to that website, and it lists all these principles. Um, Sure, there's probably good books. I'd talk to the nearest master gardener near you, um, but they are book addicts. I'm trying to get them into self-help groups where they stop <laughs> buying so many books that they don't read. Because are you really going to read that book? I'm not talking about reading it. I want to be able to identify what yeah. I'm reading. Yeah. Again, online, and there is at, at the um, Home Garden Information Center um, in, in Howard County, they have a great diagnostic tool where you can walk through and either look at the pest pictures or look at the damage that you're seeing and then eliminate it and figure out what pest that is. So that'll, that's, I think, probably a better tool. Now, are you a Luddite and you don't have a computer? No, you give me that funny look. You know the Luddites. Or oh, never mind, I can't get into that. We don't have enough time. So. Um, this is common sense. Uh, Carol will be talking about this later on, but grow pest resistant or tolerant plants. Hey, why grow that deer would be a good example, that 
gigantic bed of hostas, which is dessert. Yeah. 10,000 hostas. You're going to have every deer in the county over at your place. So start looking into plants or diversifying the landscape. So you maybe pick out some plants that deer aren't quite as interested in. It's hard to do because if you're in the hosta society, you've got a problem already, but you're going to plant <laughs> hostas. So, okay. Okay. This is a tough concept. Actually, I think it's an easy one. I talk about lawn care quite a bit. And I tell people, if you insist on having a lawn, I'm always trying to talk people out of having a lawn, but I know a lawn is a very American thing. I used to work at a, a garden center, and our bulb dealer from Holland would come over, and he would look at the shelves, and he said, lawn care, you Americans. And the garden center manager would look at him, and he said, 50% of our profits. <laughs> and he pointed all the lawn care prop products. So Americans do love their lawn care products. Um, but if you insist on, on having a lawn, do it right, and usually you can lower the need for certain pesticides just by managing your lawn correctly. I'm not going to go through it today. We don't have enough time. But know your pests because there are certain pests that are indigenous to lawns. And what's the big pest insect for, for lawns? Grubs. Japanese beetle grubs. A lot of other grubs, but primarily Japanese beetle grubs. And part of that is understanding their life cycle, their food requirements, sex life. That always gets people atten people's attention. Plant defense. And what I mean by this is that um, really we know that if we keep our lawn well fertilized, and a lot of people hate to hear that because fertilizers end up in the bay, but a lot of that is because we're not fertilizing at the correct time. Or we think, hey, one application was great, let's double it. But if you fertilize appropriately, usually most lawns will sustain and come back, will, will be able to hold off and come back from the damage from um, Japanese beetles. So if you manage your lawn and you insist on having a lawn, take care of it. And then you typically don't have to use weed killers because your lawn's thick, and you don't have to use grub control products because the, the lawn will come back after the grubs disappear. So, make sense? Yeah, you guys are ready for lunch. <laughs> I can see. Okay. So, attracting beneficials. This is a tough one. A lot of people don't like to look at the beneficials. They usually scream when they see spiders, but be considerate of what your landscape has in regards to attracting beneficials. And we'll talk about a couple of those, those insects. Wolf spiders are great to have in the landscape. They don't make big webs that you walk through in the middle of the morning when you go out for your cup of coffee to look at your garden. You know, I know you're going to all be monitoring your garden. And don't you hate that, the spider webs? In the, these guys scurry along the ground, and they're predacious. They chase down their prey. Rarely bite people, and there isn't much toxin to them. How many people think that daddy long legs are highly toxic? Oh, another myth. They are, but they do oh. bite people. Well, I'll, I'll send you some research on that. So. I read about it. Uh, we'll, we'll get rid of that brainwashing. <laughs> so, and this is a great uh, Middle Eastern expression. Your enemy's enemy is your friend. Yes? Is that the mistake? What? That's, you know, that's another one. I didn't even know that. Gosh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a mistake. Gosh, another one. So there's another one out there. So recognizing the good guys or the evidence of the good guys. These are your beneficial insects. Um, if you can't see it, this is a picture of an aphid, which we don't tend to like. They suck the plant juices out of your plants, and they transmit diseases. But what's kind of cool is that aphid has a trap door in the back. And that's where a parasite, a parasitic wasp, had emerged. Somewhere in that aphid's life cycle, the mother wasp, and they're very small, they look like gnats, landed on it and injected an egg into the aphid. And as the aphid grew, that egg, with it's kind of like an alien thing, grew inside and eventually killed it. And when you see that, I usually tell people, wow, if you start to see these brown, non-moving aphids, and if you take a, a, a magnifying glass, and these cheap $5 lenses are great to look for stuff like that, you'll know that you have that predator population there. Don't use your insecticide. More than likely, you're going to 
kill or, or reduce some of that, that beneficial population. Again, in the, in the vegetable garden, either on your peppers or your tomatoes or your uh, potatoes, eggplants, shouldn't say peppers, they really don't get on peppers, but you see this caterpillar with these cocoons. It's, it's the larvae of, a, of an insect that's slowly eating it from the inside. Leave those on there, leave them in your garden. Um, but ideally, you can go out and look for these big hornworm caterpillars and pick them off your plant. You don't even have to wait for these caterpillar infested or um, these cocoon infested um, things to show up. Um, any master gardeners, what's this? Here's the adult, here's the larvae. Come on, you guys, you all failed. I'm taking your certificates back. <laughs> Surfid fly. Looks kind of, maybe it's hard because it's down low and you couldn't see it, just nod your head. But there's seraphid flies. If you see those flying around, this is not going to eat any of your pests. But what's great about it is the larvae here will. And this is a great science project. It disgusted my daughter, but she was fascinated because I said, I found one of these larvae on the back of a leaf and it was eating aphids. But the great part is when it eats it, it pulls the aphid up and it just sucks the insides out and then it kind of discards it. And she was just grossed out, but she was mesmerized for about an hour. So if you have kids or grandchildren, it's a great thing to do. Again, you need one of these hand lenses. Um, every so often this critter shows up on my office. Uh, it's a giant um, wasp, um, ichneumon wasp, and it has this long people call stinger. It's probably this long. I've seen some this long. And it actually, it's an ovipositor and it drills it into the wood and it inserts an egg into a wood borer. So not everything with a long tail stings. Um, again, this critter here is a fly. It's called a robber fly. And they'll hang on bushes. You see them hanging. They'll catch whatever and just eat them while they're on the bush. Um, a lot of times you'll see those at the end of July into August. Anybody see them earlier? Okay, so provide habitat. I think Carolyn's going to be talking about this, but in order to protect your beneficials, you need to make sure you have support for them. Add diversity, and uh, we'll be talking about that later on in the next program. Reduce or eliminate p pesticides. Don't go out there and just habitually spray because it's on your calendar. You should have a reason for spraying. Mike Raup said it, but some people get on a schedule. Oh, this week I spray malathion. Then two weeks later they come, oh, this week I've always sprayed. You don't have to get into the habit. You can save a little money, actually. Um, try to maintain a diverse habitat. We'll talk about that in the next program. And we'll also talk about the next point. Ah, we'll also talk about that later on. Here's a couple plants that attract beneficials, mints. How many people have cursed the day they grew mint? <laughs> I have. So if you're going to grow mints or its relatives, thyme and sage and bee balm and basil aren't quite as aggressive. Well, most of those aren't. Some of the times oregano can really spread. But there are relatives in the mint family that are great in the garden that will feed, especially the adult populations of these insects. Make sure we're on time. The umbral family, these are things with those flat kind of umbrella-like flowers, Queen Anne's lace, dill, anise, fennel, they all have that. They again support a lot of those beneficial populations. Um, composite flowers, <sighs> I sh we don't have to go through the biology, and you have this on the handout. Did we hand the handout out? Oh my gosh, I lied to you. I got it here somewhere, we will pass it around. Okay, we'll get it. Thank you, Carolyn. I brought it in. What's that? It's in a flat box. Something in here. No, it's not in there. Well, maybe I didn't bring it in. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been so polite. I've been saying, oh, yeah, look at your hand out. <sighs> Sorry. We'll hand it to you, but all these things are on the handout, so don't feel like you have to be scribes right now. I can remember in college, my college professor yelling at us at one point, because we were just scribbling and he started being absurd. And, and he said, you guys are scribes. So this is my favorite. My neighbor, nah, he's currently my neighbor. When I first got the job, 
I saw him and his wife out in raincoats, and they were spraying their pin oak out front. And I said, what are you guys spraying for? And they said, there's something wrong with our tree. And then he pulled off a leaf. This isn't actually the leaf. This leaf is much healthier. And there were some aphids on the back of the leaf. So sure, we see this bug we know that sucks the juice out of your plant. You don't want that to happen. But the, what's Master Gardeners? What is this called, this, this chartreuse coloration with the deep green vein chlorosis? This is really not caused by a disease or a pest. It's just caused by poor conditions. Typically, soils are not acidic enough for pin oaks and they become chlorotic and they start to look anemic. Oh my gosh, the leaves are starting to turn this shallow yellowish green. So here they were out there and I said, what are you spraying? And they're just spraying seven everywhere. Yeah. So they're spraying for an insect. So they kind of got that right. They got the right pro product, even though we don't recommend seven because it's pretty undiscriminating or non-discriminating and it tends to kill off a lot of honeybees and, and other insects that we don't want to kill and they weren't resolving their problem. And I'm quite sure they would have moved on to the next product. Fortunately, I got them to hire an arborist who actually did some soil injections and truck, trunk injections and was able to take care of the problem um, by acidifying the soil. Um, okay, so we've kind of beaten this one up a little bit. You're, you need, if you decide to use an insecticide, make sure it's labeled for that that particular pest. Make sure that pest is listed on the label. Use it at the prescribed rate or the lowest rate that you can. And again, understand the label. Something preferably that's short-lived. And more and more of our pesticides are short-lived. And again, I get people who come in and say, ah, where is that powder they used to sell that you could dump around your house and you didn't have to worry about bugs? It's gone. You can't buy it anymore. So most, many of our insecticides are shorter-lived. Still, not all of them. But many of them are, and, and I think the movement over time will be to have uh, non-persistent insecticides, especially. And again, something that's least toxic, that makes sense. Um, the biggie here is if you decide to use it, don't fall in love with one chemical. Because we know if you use it long enough, those few individuals that are resistant will live and start breeding together and breed other resistant individuals. And that's why I think this one product that's the darling child of every rose gardener, um, imidacloprid, is probably going to lose its effectiveness because it's being pumped into all sorts of stuff. And we're just basically selecting the fittest by killing off the ones that are susceptible to that insecticide. Um, the other problem is when a plant looks sick, especially after it's been damaged by insects, our response is to try and love it to death. And I'd say don't fertilize if you know you still have a pest problem because you tend to be f adding fuel to a fire. What's fertilizer do to a, for a plant generally? And what's the big ingredient typically? Nitrogen. nitrogen. And nitrogen promotes what? Growth. New growth. And lots of sucking insects like these, these are really cool, these aphids, <laughs> love new tender growth because new tender growth is much easier typically to penetrate and to draw juices out of, and it tends to be very rich in what they're after. So many people think, oh my gosh, my plant's sick, these insects are beating up on it, I'll fertilize it and make it healthier, when in fact they're just fertilizing it and increasing that insect population. So you can't fertilize your way out of a problem. What's neat about these aphids is it's a beach, um, it's a woolly beach aphid, and if you go online, I didn't put a video in, but they show it, they, they actually do this dance when they're disturbed. And you'll see a tree covered with these white fuzzy aphids, and if you disturb the branch, they all start swaying in unison. They call it the uh, uh, woolly aphid boogie woogie or something like that, but produces a lot of black sooty mold afterwards. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about our imports. I know we're gonna run out of time. When do I, how, do I have 15 minutes, Carolyn? Wow, okay, good. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our world is dominated now, especially our woodlands and our, even our own landscapes by things that we brought in on purpose or accidentally brought in. Um, anybody know the story of this critter at the bottom? 
Gypsy Moth. How'd it get here, Connie? Um, a man decided he wanted to grow silk. <laughs> yeah. And he researched and found that this was a neglected silk moth species, or he thought. Yeah, he was from France, too. Yeah. And he also brought in white mulberries. White That's right. He introduced. <laughs> yeah. He gave up on his experiment and basically he went back to France but left his caterpillars <laughs> here and the rest is kind of history because we were plagued with gypsy moths for many years and some of that's changed. Uh, but we'll touch on some of these imports. We don't have a lot of time so I'm going to buzz by a couple of these. Um, really, yeah, we'll talk about some of the old pests that have been brought in. Hemlock woolly adelgid brown marmorated stink bug, and gypsy moth, which we were pointing out earlier. Um, how many people have hemlocks in their landscape? How are they doing? Okay. Pretty good. Are you treating for the adelgid? No, I just keep an eye on it. Anybody else having to treat for it? No. Okay. I had to previously. Okay. So if, if you aren't familiar with it, hemlock woolly adelgid is what some of my clients, when they bring in stuff, said, oh, there's styrofoam or something in my my hemlock, and they, it's this adelgid, it's kind of an aphid-like creature from Asia that's been, I don't know how long it's been here in the U.S., but it's been attacking um, hemlocks and really decimating hemlock populations. And there's some thought that hemlock populations are so reduced that this adelgid now isn't quite as successful as moving around from tree to tree. Um, there are strategies for controlling it, but it's still out there. There has been a, a, a fungus that parasitizes it, but we haven't had much luck in introducing and maintaining that fungus population. So it's kind of a cool integrated pest management strategy. Now there's some Asian beetles that were brought over and have been released in certain areas. And there's been some success, but again, there's questions as to how successful these, these these native Asian parasites are in controlling the hemlock woolly adelgid here. Um, so at this point, we still have it. Not a whole lot's been happening. Brown marmorated stink bugs. Some, a master gardener took this bottom picture. People love it, even though it grosses them out. Do you recognize what it is? Yeah, it's a praying mantis eating a brown marmorated stink bug. Um, this was we thought, my, my commercial ag person thought it was liquid gold. He said, I'm going to be wearing a crown of gold because we're going to be working on this problem for so long. <laughs> and this was what, six years ago when the big invasion came that September, all the, our phone, my phone ran off, rang off the hook. And sure enough, what's happened in the past year? How many people really were inundated? Raise your hands. Gosh, hardly anybody. Oh, one person, half-heartedly too, okay. So we got a couple. We've had some, we have this bug and we'll probably have it forever, but it seems as though its population has crashed. And there's been some observations and some studies that really indicate not necessarily chemical control, but some biological agents have stepped in. Interestingly, they found certain bird species now have or actively feeding on them. And also another introduced species has been observed, which is called the European hornet. And it's a big night, typically a night hunting hornet, that's also been feeding on brown marmorated stink bugs. So there's, there's a lot of activity going on, and that's one of the thoughts. Um, we still don't know. This is still early in the game when it comes to dealing with a new insect. You need several years of, of uh, study before you can really shake out what's going on with the population. Um, so hopefully this is, will be just background noise and most of the farmers, orchards especially, now don't consider this a big problem. I know when it first showed up here, a lot of the, um, some Chinese researchers came over and they were surprised that it was a big problem because in Asia it's maybe the third or fourth worst stink bug for them. They didn't understand why it was so bad. Yeah, I don't want to see I don't want to see number three or two or one from Asia, but there's a good chance with our international trade we could get that one day. Yes. How does one go about introducing praying mantises to um, I how does one go about introducing praying mantises? I would say don't bother. 
Praying mantises are very symbolic, I feel. They will eat, and this shocked my daughter. We had a butterfly garden out front. She was seven years old, and she's watching the butterflies, and this praying mantis nailed a butterfly, and she almost cried. <laughs> they will eat anything, and they really are out there and big and visible, but their consumption, their, po their populations typically aren't enough to really affect the, the, the population that you're trying to knock down whatever pest that is. So you can buy them online. I've seen them being sold every so often. So yes? That brings up an interesting point about purchasing them. Um, because um, yes, during this past week, I was at the man's yeah. show and I saw a couple of the companies that were selling them. And they had the, um, the uh, Latin name of them, but I couldn't tell by looking at the bag whether that was the native or the invasive. Praying mantis, and I know, um, like in Cape May, the bird observatory, the director there points out that sh just about every praying mantis that you see there is actually the invasive. Species. Oh, really? Introduced species? That's interesting. I didn't know about that. Yeah, you got to wonder. I w I would think there would be some controls on it, but who knows? So, but yeah, I would say, boy, the praying mantises that we have here probably aren't worth introducing. They're here, but they actively feeding and knocking back a population, I don't think you're going to get much bang for your dollar. So, yeah, Connie. Um, if you <coughs> hang out at the Christmas tree lots, when people are selling Christmas trees, very often the bottom branches will have praying mantis. Yeah, you can run through the lots clipping off those branches and really upsetting them. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I, had, uh, I, had a I had a raft of them hatched in the trunk of my car last spring. <laughs> yeah, I, we did that once. We had some. <laughs> anyway, gypsy moths are, is, an, is another critter that kind of spiked, and it spikes periodically in populations, but there's a couple neat things going on is there are, there's a fungus and a virus, and the fungus will build up in population enough to actually desiccate. Well, it doesn't quite desiccate, but you see these, they're really rotting corpses. They're Sorry, it's right before lunch. But there are dead gypsy moth caterpillars. And you see this as, as this fungus seems to have taken hold here. We really haven't had much problem with gypsy moths. There's still some hot spots here and there, especially in oak stands. Oregon Ridge was a good example a couple years ago where they lost a, a, a large patch of trees because there was just a tremendous population in that small area. Um, so I have a feeling, again, this will be like a lot of insects. We had big outbreaks, but now it's a little bit more like background noise, and occasionally we're going to have population spikes. So if you're in an integrated pest management, you'll be out there looking for it and hopefully be able to take steps. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go through the steps. Um, recent arrivals and knocking on the door, this is important. Emerald ash borer we know is here. It's in Carroll County now. Um, Fortunately, our ash population, at least in our woodlands here, is relatively low. So its overall impact for a lot of the woodlands won't be tremendous. But in, in home landscapes and in urban landscapes in the Midwest is a great story because rather than planting a lot of pears at one point, they, Asian pears, they planted lots of ash. And now that came to haunt them with these tremendous cleanup efforts they need to do in removing these dead ash trees in the Midwest. Um, so, and even here in Maryland, there are plenty of large urban plantings with ash. You can protect against it, but you have to pay the price. And protection at this point typically means injecting a chemical into the base of the tree that will give some systemic or system-wide protection to the plant. Um, to hold off the, this emerald ash borer. And there is one product that seems to last two to three years, but it's not cheap. So you got to weigh the value of the tree versus the cost. Yes, Steve? Yeah, the ash is also an important pollen source for pollinators, including honeybees and other bees. So you poison the... Uh, yeah, you have to watch. You, yeah, you have to weigh that out. I, I really feel that it's best to look at other tree species and replace as needed, but it's, 
it's still out there. Winter moth is something in the, Bal in the Boston area. Actually, here's pretty pictures of Emerald Ash Borer. It's a great looking beetle, but it's very, very small. And usually the first thing you see is not the beetle, but you start to see these ash trees that are declining from the crown. Yes, five minutes. To feed on what Steve said, um, that besides it being a systemic, it's a non-discriminate uh, acidal agent for all insects. Where there haven't been treating the ash trees, there's been an increase in the woodpecker population because woodpeckers go after those. Oh, they do. They haven't found, though, that the woodpeckers have been terribly successful, but they are going after them. That's, that, yeah. But it, it gets back to really the core, I think, and I know Carolyn will be talking about this, we should be diversifying our landscapes. We shouldn't fall in love with that one tree or shrub or whatever that's perfect because if you are, you don't invest your money that way. You don't buy just, well, some people do just buy one stock, but you try to diversify your portfolio. Same thing applies to a landscape. Um, winter moth we don't have. It's in the Boston area. The thing I worry about it is, and it's been in Vancouver and uh, further north, but it will eat lots of hardware, hard woods. It loves, and this, it loves maples, it loves oaks, it loves elms, um, all sorts of different plants. Um, it has not made much movement, but it's doing a fair amount of damage. And it gets the name winter moth because you will see the adult flying in November around Thanksgiving. Um, and then the eggs hatch in the spring and they chew foliage. And this is a red maple that's all tattered. So hopefully that won't move down. Kudzu bug is related to this brown marmorated stink bug. It's very similar. Fortunately, kudzu, what family is kudzu in? Beans, exactly. It tends only to feed on bean plants. That's not great for a farmer, though, because what's the big cash crop? Soybeans. Um, and it, down south, where this first showed up in South Carolina, it's quite bad. As a homeowner, this thing has the same habit of, tr of many times making its way into your house. Its big advantage is, look at it on the dime there. It's much smaller than a brown marmorated stink bug. So if you have smaller cracks and crevices, it'll be moving in. Um, so it's just shown up in Maryland. We're waiting to see how its populations progress. Same products work on it if you choose to spray, but really I say exclusion's the way to go. I'm just curious, was that bug brought in? It's, yep, it's an Asian import. Okay. We bought it. <laughs> oh no, it, it really, it does, chew on kudzu, but it was not brought in to combat kudzu. It wasn't, it, that, I, I'm not aware of that, so it does. And this I just saw last year, it's uh, Asian jumping worm, and we were over in Baltimore County, and, then, and, and these worms were going crazy around our feet. I was do, talking about invasive uh, uh, herbaceous plants that were in this woodland with a group of people, and I said, what are these worms? And these were these new Asian jumping worms. Now. Our, the dominant worm that gardeners love is the European nightcrawler. That was brought in centuries ago, probably. This new one, the worry is that it's so vigorous and it consumes organic matter so quickly that it's going to change the whole soil layer as it starts to churn the soil, and it could make it more advantageous, advantageous for certain species and less for others. We don't know what it's going to do, but it's already been observed in Wisconsin and it's changed the understory, especially plant life. But it is a, it is a, a vigorous consumer and they do jump. <laughs> and I've, the first one came into my office just this spring. So I'm gonna try and collect some more this next spring and do some experiments. Oh, uh, thousand cankers disease, maybe the last one we can cover. This is, um, just got an email yesterday saying there's a quarantine in Cecil County because it has been detected in Maryland. This affects walnuts. And it's carried by this tiny beetle here. And there's a beetle, you can't see it, at the tip of that point of a pencil. And it's called thousand canker because it drags in a fungus. Remember the chestnut blight? And, and or uh, um, yeah, it, it drags a fungus in as it's 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 uh, consuming the cambium layer, and the fungus then starts to populate populate the cambium and spread, 
and it creates all these m masses of cankers that eventually coalesce and kill the walnut. Again, we don't have lots of walnuts here, but it's a high value tree for a lot of people. Walnut wood is quite valuable. So I'm going to jump ahead of why we kill the plants we love, and that's a separate program. There is, and I'll, we'll, I'll find the handouts that you were supposed to get, um, that, but there is links to the various websites that I talked about. Um, the biggie that I didn't include that you may want to scribble down, and I think it's really, really good, is a woman in Washington State named Linda Chalker Scott. And she does uh, an online newsletter and also has a website dedicated to garden myths. And what she does is she goes through the research and then looks at a lot of these product claims or these home remedies that people are making. And some of the time she finds that some of this stuff is valid. So, any last questions before we let you go for lunch? No, we have to Oh, never mind. Hold your. <laughs> Darn. Thank you. Yes. How do you spell her name? Chalker. Linda Chalker. C A. It's, she actually pronounces it Chalker, but I said Chalker because that's a C H A U L. Oh, C H A L K E R dash and then S C O T T. And it'll be on the handout that, I'm sorry, I, I thought I had it in here, and obviously it wasn't. Yeah? Japanese funeral traps, you pour them or get them? I love them, as long as, again, the joke is, what do master gardeners say? Give them to your neighbors, great. <laughs> and you know, the same thing proved out with the Japanese beetle, tra I mean, the um, um, stink bug traps, is they did some testing because the manufacturers of the stink bug trap were saying, hey, put these in your vegetable garden, reduce the damage in your vegetable garden, and they found that same kind of issue that there was a little more damage in the garden that it was being placed in. So, yeah, I you know, they, there's a new trap that in theory USDA has approved that's even better for the brown marmorated stink bug. It's probably still a, a year or two away from being on the market that's very, very effective. So, I'm sorry to hear about your stink bug problems. Thank you.